Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another video at the Pharmacist Academy! Woo! So in this video I will be sharing with you chemotherapy clinical pearls. Now for those who don't know, clinical pearls are simply information that are very important about a medication. Okay, so whether it's about an adverse effect, the way the medication is administered, um, anything about the stability of the medication. It could be anything at all, but it's usually very interesting and it kind of stands out compared to any other medication. Now, it's very similar to Snapple facts, right? So for those who don't know, Snapple facts are like, you know, random facts that they used to put under the caps of Snapples and they were extremely interesting. I don't know if they still do it, but if you do know what I'm talking about, clinical pearls are exactly the same thing. Now, throughout this video, I'm going to have the class of medications on the top. So in this case, we have the anti-metabolites. And I'm going to have the medication name on the left column plus the brand name and also the clinical pearls on the right. So for the first medication, we have cetarabine, which we tend to use in patients with leukemia. Now, patients receiving high doses of this medication require conjunctivitis prophylaxis, with a cort corticosteroids eye drops. So usually this is dexamethasone eye drops. Now this is a very well established toxicity and it has been reported in up to 85% of patients who do not um, end up using the uh, dexamethasone prophylaxis. Next we have azacitidine. Um, this medication we usually use it in patients with leukemia also and sometimes in MDS. So for this one, if you see any unexplained reductions in serum bicarbonate, so anything less than 20 MEQs per liter, you want to adjust the dose. And this is because this medication may cause something known as renal tubular acidosis, which is a disease that occurs when a kidney fails to, fails to excrete acids into the urine, which causes a person's blood to remain too acidic or it can also happen when the body is losing too much bicarb. The next medication is methotrexate, which I know a lot of people are very familiar with this medication. Now, for patients receiving really high doses of methotrexate, you want to consider a leucovorin rescue. And this is supposed to help reduce the nephrotoxicity effect of the methotrexate and all the other toxicity, but mainly the nephrotoxicity. Hydrating the patient can also help. Urine alkaline, alkalinization can also reduce the risk of the nephrotoxicity. And this is because when the nephrotoxicity occurs, it results from crystallization of methotrexate in the renal tubular lumen. And this is what leads to the uh, nephrotoxicity. Now, methotrexate is an acidic medication, right? So it's usually... I would say like a weak acid, right? So medications are usually weak acids or weak base. Um, so this one is a weak acid. So when you alkalinize the urine, right, if you make the urine more basic, it kind of helps the medication leave your body. Um, once it, it makes it more water soluble, right, because it's going to have some kind of um, reaction, right? So if the urine is more basic and the medication is acidic, they have some kind of reaction where the medication becomes charged now, right? It becomes more water soluble. And since it's charged, it cannot cross the membrane and be reabsorbed back to your body. And it will allow the medication to clear. Now, the med next medication is Pemetrex, also known as Olimta. Um, this is a medication we tend to use in patients with lung cancer. Now, for this medication, you want to supplement with folic acid and cyanocobalamin prior to treatment, during the treatment and after treatment completion to reduce the GI and hemat hematologic toxicity, okay? And you also want to give dextamethasone three days in a row to prevent um, skin rashes that this medication can cause. And you want to begin one day before the infusion, Um and that should be good, right? So one day before the infusion, the day of the infusion, and one day after the infusion. And it's also administered over 10 minutes. So that's pretty interesting. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind when you supplement with folic acid and cyanocobalamin, the risk of neutropenia actually reduces from 32% to 2.6%, um, a study found. So it's very important. The next medication is a combination of trifluoridine and tepariso, also known as Lone Surf. Now, this is a medication we use in patients with colorectal cancer. Now, for this medication, it's dosed based on the trifluoridine component. And you want to administer it twice daily by mouth within one hour of the morning and evening meals. And this is because this medication can cause a reduction in the white blood cells. So taking it after the morning and evening meals have been shown to actually reduce this effect. And this is very important as we know these patients already are already neutropenic. So we don't want to do anything to further reduce their white count. The next medication is capecitabine, also known as known, also known as Z Lauda. Now th this is the oral pro drug of fluorouracil. Now in clinical trials, it's been sh it's been shown that you could really use this um, instead of fluorouracil, right? So if a patient cannot get fluorouracil for whatever reason, you can actually give them capecitabine. Now, the thing is that fluorouracil can be, you know, administered in different ways, right? You could do a short infusion like a bolus or an extended infusion. So that's where the benefit comes with fluorouracil. You could kind of manipulate how you should dose. You should administer it. You should administer it for the patient to get like a different um, efficacy from the medication. Aside from that, Cape Cytobine, from what I've seen and, you know, treatment for like GI malignancies, Usually, you could definitely just use um, Cape Cytobine instead of 5 a few. It's taken within 30 minutes after a meal. And the antidote for this medication is Vistagard. Um, now, Vistagard, what it does is that, first of all, this medication is about $16,000 for one dose. Okay, so it's extremely expensive, but it's shown a lot of good benefits and in, in trials okay so what they found was that when a patient is let's say having some kind of toxicity associated with capecitabine or five of few when this medication was administered within 96 hours um you know eight ninety eight percent of the patients um survived right and they were treated from that toxicity now another thing to keep in mind is that capecitabine can also increase levels of warfarin and this is something I tend to see a lot in practice. So like patients will be on Cape Cytobine or the patients will be getting fluorouracil. And these patients will be on warfarin, you know. And when you check their warfarin INR, it's going to be really elevated. And it's usually due to the uh, chemotherapy agents. Now, in this case, you can't really adjust the dose of the chemo. There's no like recommendation associated with that. What you could do is just adjust the dose of the warfarin. So you could kind of play around with that. And, you know, once you're anticipating this drug interaction, you can, you know, give the patient lower doses of the warfarin potentially. Next is fluorouracil. Now, fluorouracil, like I said, you could administer it two ways. You could do a bolus. Or you could do a continuous infusion. Now, the continuous infusion causes more hand and foot syndrome. So this is a rash that can happen on the hands, right? Right, on the palms and the soles of the feet. And the bolus causes more myelosuppression, right? So neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia. So depending on how you infuse this medication. Now, leucovorin is given with bolus administration to actually increase the efficacy. Now, this is something that we tend to do um, in clinical practice. Even though it's a little bit, it, it may cause more side effects uh, because of this, but it improves the efficacy, right? It allows the medications to be able to kill these cancer cells more efficiently. And that's because what leucovorin does is that it... and it enhances the cytotoxicity of fluorouracil by, you know, in increasing or enhancing the inhibition of the key enzyme that fluorouracil binds to. And this is the thymidylate synthase. And this enzyme is very important for DNA synthesis. So it's able to increase 
um, how efficiently fluorouracil binds to this enzyme. And like I said earlier with the cape it has the same antidote and also it can potentially increase warfarin's levels. The next medication is busulfan. Now this medication is used in patients with leukemia and also is used as, you know, like a conditioning regimen to prepare patients for stem cell transplants. Now it requires prophylactic anticonvulsants, so anything like Keppra or Phenytoin is a good option. And this is very important because, you know, some studies have shown that even when patients are on these pre-meds, you know, these uh, anticonvulsants, they still have breakthrough seizures, you know, so it's extremely important to assess these patients and place them on these anticonvulsants as needed. Now, because of its pharmacokinetics variability, um, you have to monitor these patients' AUC, um, and the AUC helps us monitor and dose the patients more, appropriate, more appropriately because with higher levels, you're going to experience more toxicity, but with lower doses, right, or lower levels, you may, it may cause, you know, graft rejection or disease or relapse, right? So it's very important that we monitor and get it at the right level. The next medication is bendamustine, which comes in two brands, Bandica and Trianda. Now, the Bandica formulation is an injectable solution, and that one is a 10-minute infusion compared to the Trianda, which is a a powder for injection. And that one is usually infused over 60 minutes. Next, we have cyclophosphamide, also known as cytoxan. Now, for this medication, it requires proper hydration uh, because of the risk of hemorrhagic cystitis. Or you could also use mesna. Now, for cyclophosphamide, you don't use Mesna for, you know, every patient that's getting the medication um, preemptively. You only do that with iphosphamide, which I didn't include. But for that one, all patients who are getting iphosphamide are required to take Mesna, usually a couple of doses um, during the time that they're getting the infusion. So they may get a dose before the, they may get like two, I believe like one or two doses before the infusion, then a couple more doses even after the infusion. And also hydration will help reduce this risk of hemorrhagic cystitis, which is caused when the medication is, you know, metabolized and one of the metabolite, acrolin, binds to the bladder and it causes, um, you know, inflammation and damage. The next medication is melphalan. Now, this medication, you know, has a better bioavailability when it's taken on an empty stomach. And also cryotherapy during infusion can reduce the risk of uh, mucositis. Now, cryotherapy is, you know, they use this for patients for mucositis because it's based on a theory that vasoconstriction, you know, in the mouth caused by cold temperatures will decrease the exposure of the oral cavity, right? So less blood will come to the oral cavity and you know the blood contains the chemo so less blood will come into the mouth and you know this will reduce the risk of the mucositis now a study found that when patients receive the ice chips 15 minutes before 15 minutes during the infusion and 30 minutes after the end of infusion they had a reduced incidence of mucositis you know but that recommendation may vary and you know different institutions but you know as long as the patient is getting some kind of cryotherapy or ice chips you know before and after the infusion usually is supposed to help them the next medication is carboplatin also known as paraplatin now this medication is dosed based on the calvert formula and i have it here for you and the for the GFR, the maximum you could use is 125. So if a patient's calculated GFR is like 150 for whatever reason, you have to reduce it to 125. And you know, for all platinums and not just this one, it requires baseline audiometry test. You know, because you know, platinums in general can cause uh, hearing loss. Maybe not oxaliplatin, but mostly carboplatin and cisplatin, as we'll see here. Um, also, for cisplatin, it requires pre and post hydration. So, 
you know, like normal salines, uh, normal saline plus about 20 MEQs of potassium chloride and one gram of magnesium usually would do the job um, before and after. And even after these patients receive these electrolytes, they tend to lose a lot of, you know, potassium and magnesium. So you still want to monitor these patients throughout the whole, you know, therapy. And as I mentioned earlier, it requires baseline audiometry. Now, oxaliplatin may cause you may cause neurotoxicity that presents as, you know, neuropathy, you know, so tingling, burning, numbing sensation of, you know, the fingers or the toes. And the interesting thing is that cold temperatures or, you know, cold drinks or anything that's cold can actually worsen this. And sometimes it can actually cause them to have bronchospasms and have difficulty breathing. So we always counsel patients to try to avoid anything that's cold while on this medication. The next medication is procarbazine. Now, this medication is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. You know, so you want to counsel patients to try to avoid anything that's high in tyramine. And also, you want to watch out for any drug interactions with any other medications that's also a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And for this me medication, alcohol should be avoided um, during when a patient is getting this medication because of the risk of disulfiram reaction. Now, the next medication is Theothepa. Now, this one has a pretty interesting clinical pearl. I don't have much experience with this medication, but for this medication, you know, they tend to use it in patients with, you know, bladder cancer, or they use it in combination with other medications to prevent rejection from a stem cell transplant. Now, it's secreted through the skin as part of sweat. So, you know, therefore, you want to recommend to the patient not to wear any, like, tight dressings or even use ointments, right? Now, patients should shower every six hours while on this medication to reduce the skin irritation because the medication can remain concentrated in your skin, and this could cause a lot of irritation. And this will be done during treatment and 24 hours after the last dose. Next, we have the antimicrotubular agents. So the first medication here, we have uh, Ixempra. Uh, so this medication is made with a diluent known as Cramifor. And a lot of chemotherapy medications are actually made with this diluent. But the thing with this diluent is that it may lead to a lot of infusion reactions. So we tend to pre-medicate these patients with H1 blockers like, you know, Benadryl or Ranitidine, H2 blockers, you know, like Famotidine. Uh, well, not not Benadryl and Ranitidine, sorry. Well, Benadryl, that's the H1 blocker. Then the H2 blockers like, you know, um, Ranitidine. That's an option. Or you could use Famotidine. Um, and also you want to include Tylenol in this situation. Some physicians include dexamethasone, but you really have to decide. I mean, it's not necessarily, but it definitely helps, though. So if a patient gets, like, let's say, Benadryl and also uh, ranitidine and Tylenol, they still have a reaction, maybe you want to consider adding a low dose of dexamethasone, maybe like 2 to 4 milligrams prior to the next infusion to help reduce the reaction. The next one is cabazitaxel, also known as Jeftana. Now, this medication, um, the diluent that is made with contains polysorbate 80, which is also associated with reactions. So you want to make sure you pre-medicate these patients so they don't have any reactions. It's also administered with continuous prednisone throughout treatment. That's just how it was studied. Um... I've been trying to find out exactly why they did that, but that's just how it was studied. So that's how it's um, used in clinical practice. And this medication may benefit patients who develop resistance um, to docetaxel. So specifically, patients with prostate cancer. So we, for those patients, one of the main agents that we use is docetaxel. So if a patient develops some kind of resistance to this or they're not responding to that, they relapse... Or anything like that, that's when we usually go to cabazitaxel. Next is docetaxel, also known as taxotir. Now, this medication is administered with dexamethasone for three days, starting one day prior 
to the infusion, the day of the infusion and one day after to reduce fluid, fluid retention and also help with infusion reactions. Now, the question I always ask people, why would you use a steroid, right, to reduce fluid retention? I, I thought that steroids also cause edema, right? They also cause fluid retention. And that's because steroids have something known as a mineral corticoid activity. Now, the mineral corticoid activity kind of determines, you know, the effect that the steroid may have on, like, your electrolytes and the amount of sodium you retain. Now, dexamethasone has zero mineral corticoid activity. So that's why we are able to use it in these patients um, to actually help reduce fluid retention. Paclitaxel. Now, paclitaxel also requires pre-medications before the infusion simply because of the diluent that it's based in. Then we have abraxane. Now, abraxane is the albumin-bound paclitaxel. Now, because it's bound to albumin, albumin is more efficient and it's more soluble, right? So they didn't need to use the cremifer in order to, to make this medication. So routine pre-medications is not typically required for these patients and they don't tend to have any you know, reactions at all. The next two medications are vincristine and vinblastine. With these medications, you want to provide a patient with, you know, medications for constipation because these medications causes a lot of neurotoxicity. So aside from neuropathy, they can actually affect the nerves in your GI. And this could cause massive constipation. So usually for any patient that's getting these medication, you want to make sure that the patient is also getting like DocuSay or even Senna to help them in case they, you know, have any constipation. And of course, everybody should know this by now. These medications are fatal if given intrathecally. I feel like this was a cliche, but, you know, I still had to include it here. Now, this medication is a vesicant, so you want to elevate extremity and use warm compressors. Now, how do you remember? Should I use warm compressors or cold compressors, right? Now, the V, right, the V in vincristine and vinblastine looks like the V in W, right? So, W looks like two Vs, right? So, that's how I know that for the Vs, the vincristines and the vinblastines, you use warm compressors. That's just one of my acronyms. <laughs> Next, we have the anti-tumor antibiotics. Now, the medications here, these are the anthracyclines. Now, for anthracyclines, they cause a lot of, you know, cardio, cardio toxicity. So usually you want to do like a baseline echo to just, you know, you want to get the baseline ejection fraction of the patient so that you can monitor the patient, you know, throughout the treatment. And these are like the doses where like it's recommended not to exceed. And these are cumulative doses. So usually if you exceed these doses... It tends to increase the patient's risk of cardiotoxicity even more. And this is not something that's going to be seen in every patient, but just know in clinical practice, that's that's typically what's seen. You know, as the doses go over for, let's say, doxorubicin, doxorubicin over 400 milligrams per meter square, that's when, you know, you should probably monitor the patients very closely. Or you could use a different agent. If you don't have any other option, just make sure you monitor the patient more closely. These medications are vesicants also, and to manage these patients who end up developing some kind of extra vesation, you want to use the MSO, dimethyl sulfoxide topical solution, uh, dextrazoxane, and elevate extremity and use cold compressors for these patients instead of warm, right? So the anthocyclines, you want to use cold compressors. Dactinomycin, um, this is also a vesicant, so similar recommendation. You want to use cold compressors. Bleomycin, um, a medication that we use um, in patients with lymphoma, um, specifically Hodgkin's lymphoma, it has a risk of causing pneumonitis. So, you know, when doses, in, when cumulative doses go over 400 units, that's when we tend to see this. And this could sometimes be irreversible, okay? So that's something you definitely want to make sure you know, your patient is not getting over 400 units cumulative doses of bleomycin. Thank God now they have, like, substitutes for this uh, 
Medication, right? So usually in patients in Hodgkin's lymphoma, they use a regimen called, called ABVD, and the B is for bleomycin. But now they have other options like brentuximab. Um, so that could kind of replace bleomycin in these patients. Um, but it doesn't have like really good recommendation according to the NCC, NCCN. Um, and they also take into consideration the price of that medication. Um, of course, bleomycin is much cheaper. But just know it's optional, you know. There's optional for patients who are unable to get bleomycin because, you know, they've kind of maxed out on the cumulative dose. Mitomycin, um, a medication that's used in, you know, anal cancer and also bladder cancer. This is also a vesicant. So you want to make sure you elevate the extremity and use cold compressors if anything occurs. The next medication is irenotecan. Now, this medication may cause acute diarrhea less than 24 hours, and this can be treated by using, you know, atropine, right? So this is a, a cholinergic type of side effect, so you could use atropine for it. You can actually give patients atropine in advance, you know, to kind of help prevent or reduce the risk of this happening. So you can always make an intervention like that if you're reviewing a patient's profile. And you're on irenotecan, you want to just check with the oncologist to see if the patient require, if they want to um, add atropine, right, as some kind of pre-med for the patient. There was, like, one patient that I had in my clinic who, you know, apparently the patient is so constipated that we actually just give irenotecan without atropine. So it actually helps the patient, you know, go. For patients who, de who develop delayed diarrhea, so this is over 24 hours, this can be treated with loperamide and or octreotide. So this one has a different mechanism compared to the acute diarrhea. So you don't want to use atropine in these patients. In these patients, If it's after 24 hours, you want to consider these other medication. It also comes in a liposomal formulation. And a lot of people don't actually know this, but yeah, it does come in a liposomal formulation. And this is usually used to treat metastatic pancreatic cancer in combination with fluorouracil. The next medication is a etoposide, and etoposide also comes as etoposide phosphate. Now, you want to slow the infusion of etoposide or else there's a risk of hypotension. So sometimes this medication can, give, can be given over like three hours, you know, because just because of the risk of hypotension. Etoposphate is water-soluble. And does not contain polyethylene glycol, polysorbate 80, or ethanol. And that can be given over five minutes without hypotension. Um, so, yeah, just keep that in mind. But the main recommendation for the slow infusion is specifically for etoposide. But then again, you know, infusing these medications over five minutes, you might want to think about it. I mean, if it's in the package insert, so it is safe, but a lot of physicians will not still do it over five minutes they may actually like spread it to 30 minutes um just to be a little bit more cautious now for the regular etoposide it also comes in oral formulation and the conversion from iv to po is two to one now for the monoclonal antibodies um the first one here we have adotrastuzumab emtacine right now, this is simply trastuzumab, which is also known as Herceptin, attached to this, you know, cytotoxic chemo known as emtacine. I believe emtacine is actually, uh, is in the class of microtubular um, chemotherapy agents. Now, what the trastuzumab does is it simply helps the emtacine get to its target, right, which is the tumor itself and then the emtacine is going to do the work once it gets there now it also requires baseline echo um simply because of the trastuzumab next medication is alemtuzumab campat and lemtrada now the lemtrada is used for multiple sclerosis the campat is the one that we tend to use in patients with leukemia now this one is not commercially available but I think they have like programs where you could still obtain the Campat. Um, you just have to apply for it. It requires pre-medications uh, prior to each dose because of infusion reactions. 
And this medication may cause a lot of viral infections, actually. Um, I believe it suppresses your T-cells. So it makes patients more prone to like a lot of infections, specifically viral infections. So when these patients are on this medication, you want to make sure they're getting prophylaxis. For PCP pneumonia, we usually back trim, right, tobacone, and herpes viral um, infection during treatment, right, or prophylaxis. The next medication is bevacizumab. Now, in this medication, you want to be cautious in patients who have like really high blood pressures. So, systolic blood pressure is over 150 or diastolic, over 100. Um, that's simply because the medication can also cause hypertension. So, if a patient has really high blood pressure, you may want to consider skipping that dose, right? Make sure you control the blood pressure before actually giving these patients this medication. You also want to, you know, counsel the patient to, you know, let you know or let the oncologist or anybody know of any like bleeds in general, right? So nosebleeds, of course, that's what they put in the package insert, but really any bleed, you want to make sure the patient um, let you guys know. And it also has the risk of causing thrombosis. Now, they recommend to administer 28 days before and 28 days after surgery. And it kind of relates to the mechanism of the medication. So bevacizumab is a VEGF um, inhibitor. So it inhibits the formation of, you know, blood vessels, right? And tumors in general, they tend to, like, release a lot of cytokines. And these VEGF, um, VEGF analogs that can bind to receptors and cause the body to, like, create blood vessels that will help supply blood to the tumor like that's crazy right like can you imagine the tumor gets in your body and then they start using your own resource um so the bevacizumab what it does is that is that it inhibits the formation of these blood vessels and this could tend to affect your own you know body's uh mechanism of recovering and like healing so that's why you know you want to make sure you administer 28 days before and after surgery. Now, we also require a baseline urine dipstick analysis to monitor for development or worsening of protein urea. And this is a very interesting side effect of this medication. It's, it has a very low incidence, actually. Um, one of the trials actually showed the incidence of grade 3 protein urea um, was about 0.8% to 4% compared to 0% to 1% in the placebo. So it's something that happens. So you just want to make sure you get the baseline and then you just monitor the patient periodically or even like three to six months. Um, but every institution may have, you know, specific recommendations. The next medication is Blincido. This is a medication that's used for ALL. And this is some this medication I'm not too familiar with, but during my research I found that you can actually administer this medication over 24, 48 hours, or seven days. I mean that is unheard of. I've never seen anything like this, but there you go, Blincido. The next medication is Cetuximab, also known as Erbitux. Now this medication is a EGFR antagonist. Now, what it does is that it causes a rash that, you know, you can see within two weeks in patients who start receiving this medication. And this occurs in over 90% of patients, okay? So it's something that usually happens. And they recommend that you should prophylaxe these patients right away, you know? So give them some kind of steroid cream and, you know, doxycycline PO to kind of help reduce the risk of this rash forming. Um, there's no therapeutic benefit in patients with mutated uh, crass um, with mu uh, mutated crass proteins, right? So if they have a crass mutation, specifically in patients uh, with colorectal cancer, you are not supposed to use this medication. Studies have shown that there is absolutely no benefit in using this medication, so it's not recommended at all. The next medication is Darzalex. Now this medication requires uh, pre-meds before and after the infusion just because it has a very high risk of causing infusion reactions. Um, they also recommend to give the patient an 
the patient's antiviral prophylaxis. And this should be started one week before treatment and continued for three months after the treatment. And in studies where this medication was used by itself, the risk of you know herpes zoster was 3% in these patients that received Arzalex. The next medication is Elotuzumab, also known as Implicity. This medication also requires um, antiviral prophylaxis that should be started before the treatment. The next medication is Portraza. Now, this medication, um, it's used in combination with like gemcitabine and cisplatin in patients with squamous cell, um, car um, squamous cell, non-small cell car uh, lung cancer. Now, they recommend that you, you know, monitor the serum electrolytes uh, prior to each dose and at least eight weeks after completion. Now, this is a very interesting clinical pearl and recommendation simply because the medication was studied in clinical trial with cisplatin, right? As we know, cisplatin causes you to lose a lot of electrolytes. So we don't really know if, you know, is this medication that's doing that or if it's the cisplatin. Excuse me. But since it's used in combination with cisplatin and gemcitabine, just make sure you monitor these patients' electrolytes. The next medication is Gaziva. Now, this is a medication that's used in patients with lymphoma. Now, they recommend to pre-medicate these patients prior to the infusions and screen for hepatitis B prior to beginning um, the treatment. All right, so usually they have to send out hepatitis B panel. Um, so that would tell you, you know, if the patient, you know, had a Hep B vaccine previously, if the patient had a previous Hep B infection, and, you know, if they did have an infection, you want to make sure the patient is, like, on the right medications to prevent reactivation of, you know, the hepatitis B virus. Then we have pan panitumumab. Now, this is a medication that's very similar to the cetuximab, so it can cause a lot of rash, um, and this usually occurs in over 90% of patients, and it has the same recommendation with the CRAS mutations. So anybody with a CRAS mutation in colorectal cancer will not benefit from this medication. Then we have pertuzumab and trastuzumab, and these two rec require baseline echo, prior to, you know, treatment and during treatments, usually three months after, then six months, um, and there and therefore. Next medication is Cyramza. Now, this medication requires uh, pre-medications also before the infusion. And you want to monitor the patients with hypertension and also for, like, nosebleeds and things like that. Um, it has a very similar mechanism to a Vastin. So everything that applies to a Vastin kind of applies to this also. Next, we have rituximab, pre-medications prior to the infusion, and you want to screen the patients for hepatitis B prior to beginning the treatment. Next, we have the immunomodulators. So lenalutamide, pomalidomide, the little mind, you know, these patients must be registered with the REMS program because of the risk of, you know, causing birth defects. Um, so these patients definitely have to be registered and they have to be on the appropriate contraception before they get these medications. It can also cause thrombosis. So prophylaxis is usually recommended for these patients. So anything from Lovenox, Warfarin, the DOAX is a little controversial still in clinical practice, but, you know, the NCCN is starting to lean more towards, you know, recommending it. But then again, you still have to weigh the risk and benefits um, of using these agents in these in patients, right? So if a patient cannot use Lovenox for whatever reason, then you could consider using um, some of these agents. Now for hormonal agents like apalutamide, Bicalutamide, enzalutamide, flu, flu, flutamide, nilutamide. All these med medications are used in patients with prostate cancer. Now, for specifically enzalutamide, enzalutamide, which has a Z in it, has a seizure risk. So that's how I remember. Apalutamide also have 
um, a seizure risk. But unfortunately, it doesn't have any Z in it. So yeah, that sucks. You just need to remember that. Now, these medications are used with luteinizin, right? So that's supposed to be an L right there in front of the U. So luteinizin hormone releasing hormone agonist to reduce tumor flares, right? So these medications are anti-androgens. So they're able to like... So what happens when you use a LHRH agonist, right? What you ultimately want to do is reduce the levels of testosterone. But since it's an agonist, once it binds to the receptor, it causes an initial flare in testosterone. So if, let's say, you know, the patient has a tumor, right? If the patient's tumor is, like, really driven by testosterone, right? If testosterone is what's really causing the tumor to grow, in this case, the patient will have some kind of tumor flare, right, where they experience more symptoms. And it's even more detrimental if the patient has, like, a tumor in the spine. You Let's say you give a LHRH agonist without an anti-androgen anti -androgen antagonist, right, to, like, block the effect of these uh, surge and um, these hormones, right? If you don't do that, it may cause a lot of problems, the patient can potentially become paralyzed, okay? So these agents are always, you know, recommended to be used with, well, LHRH agonists are recommended to be used with, you know, these agents here. Next, we have abiraterone, always, also known as Zytiga. It's taken on an empty stomach at least one hour before or two hours after food, and it's administered in combination with prednisone simply because of its mechanism where it, it inhibits CYP17-alpha-hydroxylase. And this is meant to reduce the levels of androgens like testosterone. But this CYP enzyme is also important for the production of you know the cortisol in your body. So you want to make sure you replenish that by giving the patient prednisone. Next, we have gocerulin and luprolide. Um, so these are the LHRH agonists. So like I said, use <clears throat> with an anti-androgen to reduce the risk of tumor flare. And usually they start the combination. They start the uh, anti-androgen like a week before the patient actually get their first dose of the um, LHRH agonists. Next, we have digarelix. Um, Firmagon. Now, this medication is simply a LHRH antagonist, so it doesn't have a risk of that initial flare, um, where you know it's not an agonist, right? So it doesn't. It's not going to bind to the receptor and cause an increase in testosterone, which can potentially cause the tumor to grow and make the patient's you know symptoms worse, right? It's an antagonist, so it just goes directly and blocks this receptor. Next, we have Faslodex. This medication is given as IM only, all right? So not sub-Q, only IM. And it's dosed by, you know, the dose is usually 500 milligrams. I don't think I've seen anything less. And 500, 500 milligram dose requires two IM injections. And these are long needles. So this is something you probably don't want, you probably want to tell your patient in advance. The next medication is Tamoxifen, also known as Novadex. Now, this medication can be used in patients with, you know, premenopausal, um, who, premenopausal patients who have breast cancer, right? Um, it can be used for 5 or 10 years uh, with improved survival in patients who actually use it for 10 years versus the 5. But after 5 years, you know, the risk of endometrial cancer increases uh, significantly. But then the 10 years has like improved survival. So, you know, physicians really need to weigh the risk and benefit associated with that. And that will be the end of this video. Um, I wasn't feeling so well, so I hope I was able to speak clearly for you guys to understand. I have like some allergies, so I really felt like coughing throughout the video, but I didn't. Thank God. So I really hope you guys were able to understand. If you have any questions, just drop it down there below um i hope this video was definitely helpful to you guys so make sure to like comment subscribe and share with somebody that may benefit from this video and until then take care
Oh, God.